Jonathan Davis of NHL Network Radio. I'm just curious, sir, were you frustrated in any way that you weren't able to complete another deal today? No. No, we were pretty much done yesterday. Who did you want me to get? I'm I'm not I'm it's not up for me to decide. I'm just <laughs> one You you can that, that that's your call. I was just curious if you were looking to make another deal. No. No, pretty much uh and I'm, like, Crosby wasn't available? Paul Coffey? Crosby. Oh! Yeah, well, that would have frustrated me. But <laughs> uh, we were pretty much, like I say, once we got uh, the defenseman, the only other thing we were looking at was obviously with Gabrick out looking for, um, you know, the experienced player that could play in your top six. So, and then, I lo- you know, I talked to a lot of people today, but I didn't anticipate anything and it didn't surprise me. Next question. Go ahead, please. Hey, Dean, it's Dennis Bernstein from the fourth period. Did you take any incoming calls on players? Today? Last week? Incoming calls? Yep. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, this process starts, you know, you get a bunch of cue cards and you put the team on, you work through so you can go back to conversations two, three weeks ago in terms of you know, buyers and sellers. So, I mean, essentially it comes down to real. If you're, you're not doing your job unless you've talked to just about every team, except the ones in your division where you know it's probably not, or except, you know, Guys in your state because it's just not practical. So, sure. but essentially, over two, three week period, you'll talk to just about everybody. There's a funnel effect on guys that you continue to check in with, and then as you narrow it down, it gets smaller and smaller. And then after last night, today, actually, you 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 actually are right. You get more incoming calls because people are still looking to dump or you know move people. But so. You know, this is a two, three week process and quite frankly you could say that you know, our one you know, getting with Cavier and Shen when we did was could you say is part of the same chain of events, you know, it's just that we did it earlier. So um probably started the ball rolling in terms of trade deadline with with that deal. So the yeah, have a follow up. Do did the Sakara deal have any effect on how you looked at rentals this year? For sure. I think it's um well, you always learn from things, right? And um you know, obviously that it's no reflection on the player. He's a good player. Right. Um but there is an issue of timing, there is an issue of cost, and then there's an issue, let's face it, of how the team did, right? So and this is one case where I guess hindsight is twenty twenty and is when you can evaluate the value of a deal. So, um, yeah, I mean, you you learn from every deal you make, mm-hmm. and bad. And again, it's not the player, but I guess the result. And um, but that's all part of gaining experience and learning from it. So, uh, learn you learn from that one just like you learn from the Gabrick one. And that's just the nature of the beast. You're, you're going to make mistakes, and you better face up to it. But I just want to make clear it's not a mistake in the sense of the player. It's, it's it's a cost factor. It's a timing factor. And then it's a result factor. It is not a reflection on the quality of the player. Thank you, Dean. Hey, uh, Dean, it's Rich Hammond. Um, you, you guys obviously got off to a, you had a pretty hefty lead there in the division no, they're they're creeping up on you a little bit, especially ducks and, and sharks. You feel like you're still set up to end up where you want to be, and after everything shakes out at the deadline, are you still comfortable with with where you sit? You mean where our record is? Well, not so much the record, but just where I mean the ducks made a lot of moves today, and I mean those teams have been creeping up on you. And just in general, after all this shakes out, are you still still comfortable with where you sit? And, oh, yeah. Yeah. Who else? Who's another? 
it was a soft one, right? Yeah. So just trying to check up on the charter here. Um, well, I think I've said this uh, to you guys, and and I've said it to the players. A couple of things. Um, you know, there's there's always a different set of challenges when you're um, in terms of what this uh, era is going to stand for, and one of them is, in fact, being more. Uh, you know, having a better regular season and not having to, uh, you know, seventh or eighth place, or because there is an advantage to it as well as a challenge. You should want to win your division as well as the Stanley Cup. Now we all know the Cup's clearly the most important by far. However, it's still a challenge that any team that's going to want to pride itself on being a top team. It's to be good during both and excel during both. Um, so that is one of the goals they had set out to. And now, for the first time in in these guys, and rather being, they got off to a big lead. And you know who, you know, there's a mindset that a, a real pro has to learn to deal with. Well, you got a big lead, and so what are you gonna do with it? Are you gonna, you know? let some games go that you weren't ready for, or are you going to meet the challenge? And I think they're in the midst of that now. I, I think um, you can't look back and say, well, this happened, uh, you know, four years ago or three years ago. Yeah, they had a big league and let it go. And uh, But this is new turf for a lot of them, and um, it's also new in the sense, and you've heard me talk about it too, that the transition in the leadership group, because we lost some guys that knew how to win, um, that some guys are responsible for taking over and making sure this doesn't happen. So, am I comfortable? Um, no. I mean, I'd like to have a 20-point lead. I mean, quite frankly, if we still had a 10-point lead, I probably wouldn't be comfortable. But and then, but I think last night, as everybody who called me today, like all the calls that I took, as one of you just said, the love, the incomings. I think every conversation started out said, what a game last night. That was one intense game. That was a high-level playoff game. And um, I think it's very clear that, uh, you know, that this battle uh, between, um, you know, these Southern California teams, and it's not going away anytime soon when you look at the average age of our two teams um, I guess that's what sports is supposed to be about. So, hell, after the intensity of that last night, hey, you have a 20-point lead and you still wouldn't be comfortable because that's a war. You better show up ready to play. I mean, that was a man's game last night. And like I said, I'd, every general manager called me today started that conversation saying what a game that was. Other than the fact they had to wait 10 minutes for a decision, but everything else was pretty good. <laughs> Dean, this is uh, Josh Cooper with uh, Yahoo Sports. Um, so many times around this time of year, you get unrestricted free agents end up coming to terms with the team that they're playing for. Uh, as far as things go with Milan Lucic right now, where are you? And did you try to get something done with him before the deadline? I, I think uh, safe to say we are. We've had a number of discussions with a lot of our free agents and are trying to piece together a puzzle, and everything's been pretty positive up to this point. I mean, the only risk on that, you know, um, is you run the risk that, let's face it, it's not easy for any player, some some players, young, old, that um, when you sit down after we got Kopitar and put together your plan, you see how th- some things come together with Schenner and LeCavier, and you look at your team, and then you kind of get your plan together before, well before the deadline. Um, you know, that's the one thing, too, and somebody asked me, too, about, you know, did Sakara change things? Well, the one thing it did that had nothing to do with the players, it made very clear to me that you have to have, like, you see people having a, 
plan for building, right? I mean, every time you talk to a GM, has got a team. Yeah, I've got a three, five-year building plan, and I guess it's safe to say I've got pretty good experience in that. Reality is, as I've told a number of people and have talked to a lot of people, I don't have any experience in trying to stay on top. That's reality. I can say I've been around. Yeah, I'm one of the most senior GMs out there, but the truth is it's a different animal. It's where we all want to be, but when you get there, you go, wow, this is different from trying to build like I did in San Jose and here. You know, we're on, And one thing I learned from last year was, whether you want to call it a five-year plan, you've got to put that in place. And I know, again, what do you call it, a plan or a window, but that should have a plan too. So in learning from that experience, I think about two months ago, we really started looking at a five-year plan, so to speak, knowing that it has to change, you know, if the cap's going up and what players will do. But we had started after Kopitar was done and, and staying within that framework and then trying to sign a number of guys, not just Luch, but a number, because it's all making them fit, right? If, right. if Luch wants this, then maybe give him more term so I can get this guy who takes less term. The only risk to that is you don't want players distracted because that can happen. They worry about a little and, you know, what to do. Should I take it, not take it? But we've erred on the side of let's let's open discussions here because in the long run, you know, if particularly these guys that you would expect to quote unquote fit in your plan, you you have those discussions. And then you know other guys that you haven't opened up yet, you want to get through these guys because you want to move to the next guy. You know, so um, I don't know if that's a, as you guys know, it's very hard to answer your questions in a soundbite because it's such more. But. Um, that's it, but so uh, that's pretty much it. Dean, it's hey, John. Dean. And just a follow-up. You were talking about how last night was a man's game. When you're trying to make a deal, especially at this time of the year, how important is it for you to, when you know you look at the guys you took, you acquired lately in Scuderi and then Bristie, guys that have been there before, how much of that plays into your decisions on players to acquire? Huge. I think, you know, Rob was, you know, fairly easy – the biggest thing, too, is as you saw that work out, that, you know, and keeping your eye on the cap, and then the thing with Rob was obviously next year's salary. Like, I could have got him earlier, but there was an issue in the money the next year. But the way that is now structured, it was almost like you're not going to get a better player than that for what we're going to end up paying. And then it becomes the issue of, okay, um, before we did it, we went back and uh, Daryl and the coaches and I and Blakey, we sat and watched Rob's game in Pittsburgh and Chicago. Then we put in the games uh, that he played in the conference finals with us before we left and then tried to make a decision on on was the drop-off, so to speak, an issue of his being slower or whatever, or maybe the role and the fit not being right and him being caught in between. And I think all that work was done uh, Daryl talked to Rob. We got permission from Chicago to talk to him before. Uh, and one thing good about it is he knows what Daryl expects. Then I talked to him about, you know, the team now. And the other thing, too, about moving his family. I thought it was critical that one of the reasons I think he left was because life wanted to be closer to his um, family. I was one of the I don't want you coming out here if the wife's staying back east. And she was all excited. So, and the guy, he commands a lot of respect in that room. So that, for, and for and like I said, for given what we have to pay him, in, you know, as well, as well as fitting in, it's almost like, well, it makes too much sense. Um, and then on the other guy, you're right. No, you, you've seen us do that before, right? When we got Stoll and Mike, it was either guys who had been to the finals or won. A lot of those veterans had been in that position. And, you know, certainly Versteeg fits that. And the other thing, too, is Daryl's very familiar with Versteeg. So even though we're not as familiar with him as maybe like a Scuderi having been here, there's also a history with Versteeg uh, with the Sutter family, if you go back to his time in uh, Alberta. So, um, but the winning part you're talking about, absolutely. As you, as, you, as you said, it's a war zone. You better know what you're getting into. You know, I think we just had a taste of that last night. Thank you. Dean, this is uh, Josh with uh, Yahoo again. Just uh, 
it, it seemed like when, when the Blackhawks started making moves around the trade deadline, it kind of it, it, it sort of felt like it ratcheted up the pressure on a lot of other contending teams. I, I know you said you kind of started this process about three weeks ago, but but when when a team like that 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 won last year starts making some moves and and muscling off, I mean, does that around this time? Does that kind of ratchet up the pressure on you? Do you feel that to some degree? <clears throat> no, I, I don't think you – I think now you're getting into one of the original questions here or what I alluded to. Um, you got to have a plan and stick with it in building as well as the quote-unquote window. And uh, I've never been that, oh, yeah, they did this, we got to do that. I, I think that's dangerous. And I don't. I clearly don't think it came into um, play here because one of the things that if the money. Because remember, if you look, we had to uh, take a piece of Airhoff for this year. Well, I knew Stan was getting lad, so part of the reason why I got held up was, um, you know, that part of the money he had to have. So, you know, I wanted to get Eric. You got, you know, I know you're getting lad, so that's why you got to have 50%. Yeah, you do what you got to do. It doesn't surprise me one bit. He, I mean, you could have guessed that he was going to do that two months ago, and he's really good at what he does, no doubt about it. And if you looked at it, it doesn't surprise me one bit. But is that going to make us go out and say, wow, we got to do this, that? No. No, I think that's dangerous. Um, you got to look at your team, and it's always been how good are we. Yes, you look at your matchups. But I think you start getting into that, you might be throwing around first rounders before you know it. Thank you, uh, Dean. I know it's it's really fluid, but do you have any idea on Gabrick? I mean, do you do you think he might be playoff ready, or how how does that project over the next you know month and a half here? Um, you mean do I think he'll be ready? What's your question? Essentially, when is he going to be ready? Do you have any idea? Yeah, well, I think that the the goal would be, you know, sometime a little prior to the playoffs. We'll see. I mean, the thing with these things is there is an element of uh, two things. One, you know, how quickly he heals, and secondly, how hard he works. I think you guys know the story of Tony Granato when Tony pulled it off where a little different. That's what I was um, when his ACL. I had him in San Jose, or, or was it when I have him? He set a record for coming back in six weeks. It was ridiculous. Um, so part of a player coming back in this type of injury is one, just his biological makeup in terms of healing, and secondly, is how hard you work. And Granado was an absolute nut uh, and broke the record for coming back. I mean, there's been anywhere from. You know, somebody with Granado's injury did it in five weeks, and other people took ten weeks. So we'll see. But that would probably be a reasonable estimate sometime close to the playoffs, very close. And then uh, just if I could, what um, what kind of impact or uh, input, if any, did Daryl have in, in acquiring Brett and be able to gauge his reaction or his thoughts on that? Uh, well, th- 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 he's going to uh, – we're – Chances are, and in probably the next couple of days, we're going to call him up and play him on the first line and move Carper, Carter, uh, Colby Tarter to two hole. <laughs> so, now, now, um, the, other than the, the, Brett is perfect, made this call, be, or in Blakey, quite frankly. Blakey runs the team, and actually, Blakey came to me with this three weeks ago, and, um, he said, I, we really need a kid like this in the minors. He knows how hard he works and what he stands for. I said, well, you know what the issue is? I says, as a player, I got no problem with this guy because he's exactly the type of guy. He's a sutter. He's your old throwback sutter. I take him in a second. But you got to make a decision as the general manager of that team. Is there any you know, potential, whatever? And he did some checking on, um, you know, with Brett and actually had a talk with Daryl. And so... Uh, so you have to ask Blakey more specifically, but that was my question to him. But as far as the player, you definitely want this guy around your younger players, that's for sure. And he can come up and help you when he needs to because he ain't going to cheat you, that's for sure. Thanks. Surprised you're still on this call, Rich, after your, your go at Pete Carroll, his latest antics, but I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 
still wait. I'm still waiting for your response to the Matt Liner to, to your practice. That, that didn't deserve a response. That mean I, I just said that's it. If that's what we're associating, we've got no chance in a war zone. No chance. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Time for another question or two. Are you good? Yeah, everybody good out there? Where's Lisa? Lisa Dunn? Uh, I've got a cold, I've got a cold, yeah. Dean. I don't, I don't want to uh, cough on this call. Oh, she has been tweeting. Oh, she has been tweeting. Okay. All it's right. a tough trip for everybody. <clears throat> everybody okay then? Yep. Thank you. Thanks for the uh, participation. Thank you. Thanks for asking. Dean.